Thanksgiving, a time to stop, reflect, and give thanks. Sorry, pal. Thanksgiving is over. Coming Saturday, November 29th. What is that? A monster turkey? Zack, AP, let's ranger up! Ranger Command faces a new powerful foe. <laughs> and help comes from an unlikely source. Hey guys, look over there! Aya! Another ranger? But whose side is he on? Alright, now it's my turn! Who is this new ranger? Will this new ranger's help be enough? Or will they need more? Find out on the next episode of Ranger Command Power Hour on rangercommand.com and the Four-Eyed Radio Network. Hey listeners, Eric here, also known as b 47 from the Starfleet Escape Podcast and the Ranger Command Power Hour. The more phenomenal episode you're about to listen to is brought to you by Raven Designs, illustration and design that fit your personality. For samples and inquiries, visit ravencruise.com. Hello, and you're listening to Your Majesty's Secret Podcast. I like my podcast, Shaken, Not Stirred, only on the Four Eyed Radio Network. If you'd like to check out more shows, go to foureyedradio.com. Bond. James Bond. Shaken, Not Stirred. Utter one more syllable, and I'll have you killed. I thought Christmas only comes once a year. For your eyes only, darling. I never joke about my work, 007. For England, James? Come in, Univex. James Bond here. Am I going to have a problem with you, Bond? Allow me to introduce myself. You're that secret agent! That angry secret agent from England! No, you're cleverer than you look. Mm, still better than looking cleverer than you are. My God, what's Bond doing? I think he's attempting re-entry, sir. 007 reporting for duty. Hello, the name's Berkeley, Ziggy Berkeley, from Cinema on the Rocks, and with me is Eric Dewey, from Socially Awkward Studios, and you are listening to Her Majesty's Secret Podcast, only on the Four-Eyed Radio Network. That's right, this is the show where we discuss bondage, James Bondage, all things James Bond 007. But this time, we're going to take a slight detour, and we're going to talk about some more of the films from the very first man to play 007, in the official Eon films, that is. We're going to discuss some of the films of Sean Connery. Yes, indeed. Some uh, kind of kind of a wide range of films here, as far as uh, theme. Uh, <laughs> um, not not last time we did this, we tried to look at movies that were kind of Bond-like in nature, yeah. and uh, in in this case, we kind of st- stepped away from that just a little bit. And yeah, it's we're just kind of focusing being on Bond-like Connery. in nature. This is this is this is more chronological. This is the period between. His stints as 007. So between Diamonds Are Forever and betw- and Never Say Never Again. All right. So we're going to be looking at a uh, couple of movies, uh, three movies from the 70s, uh, one from the late 70s and one from the very early 80s. Um, some interesting films, to be sure. It's going to be an interesting discussion. I uh, hope you all enjoy that. Um, we should probably, since if you're listening to this episode on time when it releases, I believe there's still time left. There the is. You've still got till Thursday, if you're listening to this on time, to enter our Holiday Returns Contest. Do-do-do. Yes. All you have to do is think of a James Bond movie. Not that hard, considering that you're listening to this show. Pick a Bond movie, any Bond movie. Get any one of the Eon Bond films or Never Say Never Again. And let's face it, there's at least one thing with every Bond movie that we want to change. We want to know what that one thing is from one of those movies from you. So if you decided that Jack Lord was too much of a stiff and should have been recast in Dr. No, or if you decided that the Vanish needed to vanish from Die Another Day, those are qualifying answers. However, if you think Die Another Day needs to be completely scrapped and rewritten, while we totally agree with you, that is too much. You Not can only pick one thing question. from one movie, but you can find all of the contest rules and the entry form, conveniently enough, on our site at hermajestyspod.com slash contest. 
Yes, indeed. There is still time. Go enter. We want as many entries as possible. Remember that we're not judging based on if we like it or not, or if we agree or not. As long as it qualifies along the rules that we've set forth, you are entered in the drawing. It's going to be a random drawing. Now, if we do like your answer, and whether we agree with it or not, if we like your answer, we will probably read it on that episode of the show. So... And get those entries in for more than one reason. And uh, there's some great prizes we're giving away with this. We're giving away the awesome little DB5 Hot Wheels car, the little silver DB5 from Goldfinger. It's I, I want to keep this thing so bad. But anyways, we're also giving away a pack of 50th anniversary James Bond playing cards and the 50th anniversary uh, CD song soundtrack. Um, just some really good stuff. And who knows, there might be some other stuff thrown in there as well from, uh, from us and from the four radio network by the time everything is said and done but those three guaranteed prizes to our winner so get those entries in you can email your answer to contest at her majesty's pod or just simply go to her majesty's pod.com slash contest and plug your answer right into that form click send and we will receive it Indeed, and you don't have to worry about Eric having played with the DB5 because everything is brand new and sealed in package. Well, I wasn't supposed so to. So he's it out only been it. able to stare at it. I wasn't supposed to take it out and play. I wasn't supposed to get down on the floor and vroom 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 around. I didn't, but I wanted to so bad. Um, no, even if I did, even if I was keeping it, I'd probably leave it in the package just for you know collector's sake. But he would totally play with it. I yeah, that's another possibility. I probably. <laughs> I so probably would. Oh, anyway, so. But that's okay, because you know what? This that Enjoy it. Stuff is meant to be played with. That's enjoy it. Had for. fun with. And contests are meant to be entered. And you have until the end of the day in your own time zone. We're being really lenient here. We are On generous hosts. Thursday, November the 27th, 2014. Yep, get them in. Get your entries in. Yeah, Tile, Europe, we're still waiting. Yeah, Ryan, yeah. you said on the Facebook page we're going to get that enter- answer in, but uh, we haven't seen it yet, so hurry up. All right, so... Um, and all of our friends, we have lots and lots of people listen to the show all over the world. We've had entries from several different countries. We want to hear from all of them. Yes, you sitting there in Bahrain, we want to hear from you. You sitting there in New Zealand, we want to hear from you. You sitting there in Siberia, we want to hear from you. Everyone around the world, do they know it's Christmas time at all? <laughs> that that guy over there sitting on your booty in Djibouti. Get it, get your entry in. Come on now. Do they have internet in Djibouti? I just like saying I'm Djibouti. I'm sure they do. The internet's everywhere. Come on. Djibouti, Djibouti. Al uh, Gore has made sure of it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was the second thing he did after inventing it was make sure that everybody has it. These un- uncontacted tribes in the jungle and rainforest or whatever. He's like, uh, yeah, you didn't see me here, but uh, here's some internet. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've got internet and Starbucks. Oh, Starbucks. I can go for a coffee. So, um, these movies. In what order? Were we going to take them chronologically? Let's, or let's do them chronologically. Okay. And let, let's start with something a little more conventional first. Okay. Because I was going to say there's two of them that uh, came out the same year. Yep. We're starting with a film from 1974. So, three years after... I mean, not three. Yeah, three years after Diamonds Are Forever. And that is... One of th- this is something that I think every cinephile, someone who really enjoys classic Hollywood, should go see hmm. at least once. Because not only is this a very classic story based on a great novel, one of one of the all time great mystery novels, um, it's also one of the last gasps of old Hollywood that is not a disaster film. So you have some of the greatest actors of the classic Hollywood era coming together. And in order to get all of these actors together, the director, Sidney Lumet, thought, you know, we should cast the most famous one first. And interestingly enough, even though this particular actor had a hard time finding work after giving up 007 for the second time, Sean Connery was still considered the biggest name, so he was cast first. And that is, of course, in Murder on the Orient Express. Yes. Um, This is a movie that it has all the hallmarks of a classic Hollywood film, uh, most notably of which most of the time I would skip over this movie in favor of something newer and flashier. Um, This is not something that even though I have actually read the novel a long time ago, but I have actually read the novel and I enjoyed it thoroughly. It's not one that I probably would have watched 
other than for the fact that we were doing this show. Um, and I'm very, very glad that you made me watch this for this episode because I really th- thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, I kind of put my prejudice of old movies aside and, uh, and and gave it a good shot, and I was I was pleasantly surprised. In fact, I think I'm going to uh, try to make my wife watch this one with me. She's actually a fan of old and classic movies, and she hasn't seen this one, so I think uh, I tried to get her to watch some of the other ones with me, and unfortunately... Uh, <laughs> The one that she happened to, to stumble in on when I was when I was in the middle of watching it was quite odd and kind of turned her off from the idea. She's like, I don't want to know what you're watching for this episode. <laughs> but that was uh, that was kind of the aberration of the uh, of the thing. So no, but Murder on the Orient Express, fantastic film. Just from a filmmaking uh, perspective or from a film watching perspective, I really enjoyed watching this film. I thought it was very well done and. Uh, just uh, just an all-around solid movie I would recommend to, to just about anybody. If you enjoy movies, you should watch this one. Yeah, it's, it's based, of course, on the novel by Agatha Christie, and she in turn drew her inspiration from two different items. First, the kidnapping of the Lindbergh baby, mm-hmm. and then also the fact that the Orient Express train once got stopped in a snowstorm for five days and was just stuck waiting for the track to get plowed out. So she combined these two things together to craft as, like I said, one of the great mystery novels of all time, and features her standard character, her great hero, Mr. Hercule Poirot, who is, of course, Belgian, not French. (laughs) And threw me off a little bit, but that's all right. (laughs) And the cast that was put together for this movie, as mentioned, is just a cast of the gods. Um, Sean Connery is, of course, the reason that we're talking about this movie today, but just listen to some of these other names. We have in the starring role as Hercule Poirot, which was very interesting because he was at least 20 years too young to play this part. They basically shellacked him, and I'm not kidding when you see his hair. Oh, it's it's bad. (laughs) they, They shellacked him with loads and loads of makeup while he was sleeping, no less, because that's the only way they had time. They actually had a makeup crew Go to his go to his room, gently lift him off the bed, put him into an ambulance. Not kidding. I am not making this up. They'd start to put on his makeup while he was sleeping in the ambulance, drove him to the set, finished up his makeup, and gently woke him up. Because that's the only way he had time to get all of his makeup on, because he was also doing a stage play at the time. And that is a, another Bond connection, Mr. Albert Finney, who you may remember from Skyfall, telling you to welcome to Scotland. <laughs> Um, yeah, just, uh, I can, I can, uh, understand the amount of makeup and stuff they had to put on him to, because it was pretty obvious, but, uh, especially the hair. Yeah. I didn't, it's kind of funny that they would have to drag him into an ambulance while sleeping to do it, but hey, you got to do what you got to do to get the job done, right? Indeed. And then for other fans of Bond offshoots, another member of the cast is Mr. Michael York who one may remember from the Austin Powers series, which I'm sure we'll talk about one of these days. Um, <laughs> he was also he would also, a couple years after this, do Logan's Run, famous among sci-fi fans, of course, and also the last old-school sci-fi film before Star Wars, in terms of major Hollywood hit. Um, however, for me, the true highlight of this movie's casting has got to be the grand, one of the grand dames of all of Hollywood, Lauren Bacall. She is just phenomenal. I, I loved her in everything I've seen her in, and this is definitely no exception. And she's playing a character I would normally not be able to stand, but she just pulls it off. <laughs> yeah, I agree. She does a fantastic job in this, and um, you know, she's someone I've always known just as, oh yeah, she's a, an older actress, and she's been in a ton of stuff before, and now they put her in for, for name recognition more than anything else, but there's a reason that she has that name recognition, and you can tell when you watch something like this that, uh, you know, there's a good reason she's ha- she has that name recognition now. It's because uh, she was very, very good at what she did. So definitely a, a highlight, as you said. And then also with her is another one of Hollywood's grand dames. In fact, um, another one of the famous co-stars of Humphrey Bogart, who, of course, Lauren Bacall was married to before he died. Um, and that is Ingrid Bergman, who won an Academy Award for her supporting role, even though it is one of the smaller parts in the film. And in fact, the majority of her role is in a single scene that's one take that's five minutes long. And 
interesting thing about that is she's playing a Swedish nanny type character, um, basically Christian missionary. And she had been acting in Hollywood and in Britain for so long that even though she's a native Swede, she'd lost her accent (laughs) and she had to get a dialect coach to get it back. Oops. And then lots of other great people in here. Anthony Perkins. Yes. From psycho playing someone who is obsessed with a mother figure. And also from Psycho, playing the director of the Orient Express train, Martin Balsam, who played the private investigator who first figured out that Norman was bad news and didn't live long enough to tell anybody. (laughs) Hey, wait a minute. So, and there's more. Sir John Gielgud is in this movie. Just, it goes on and on and on. There are so many fantastic people. this This is the kind of cast that you only normally see in a disaster flick. And... Nope. Here we have just a classic mystery, very well done in grand old Hollywood style. So if if it takes names to get you to watch a movie (laughs) and Sean Connery turns out to be one of the least of them, that should tell you something. Yeah. And uh, surprisingly enough, uh, Sean Connery's part in this was actually one of the smaller ones as well, I believe. Um, It. I, I was trying to count the amount of time he was on screen, and it wasn't as much as I was, I was expecting a Sean Connery movie. And then, you know, he's there, but that's about it. I mean, this really is an ensemble piece. Where you, you don't have, with the exception of Albert Finley, you don't have any one character on the screen for the majority of the movie because everybody has to have their turn. So it makes sense. But at the same time, I, you know, being that they pushed that name on it, you'd, you'd think it would be a bigger part. And especially since he was the first, again, the first person cast, he ends up being about the third build because, of course, Albert Finney playing Poirot ends up being the lead. Lauren Bacall being Lauren Bacall gets second billing. And she also has a bit of a larger role just because she keeps showing up and interrupting everybody. (laughs) Kind of like me whenever Eric talks, but, you know, (laughs) sorry. (laughs) No, it's um, it was just a very solid, well done film. I, I felt the acting performances, for the most part, while over the top by today's standards, you know, that's one of the things that kind of turns me off about older movies. Typically, is the is the the, the ham handed acting, um, it, which was indicative of the time. That's just the way they did it then. But uh, it's usually a little too much for me. And this one, I didn't feel that way for the most part. There were a couple of moments when I was like, oh, okay, dial it back a bit there. But for the most part, it was not as intrusive as in other older movies that I've seen that uh, that turned me off. So definitely, I think, a good starting point, uh, especially if you haven't gotten into older movies in the past and you want something that maybe you can relate to a little bit better. I think this might be a good a good starting point. Indeed. And as far as the overacting, part of it, too, is... The character of Hercule Poirot is supposed to be larger than life, a little bit comedic, um, almost vaudevillian in terms of his approach. So the shellac is more than just his hair. (laughs) (laughs) But for those who are interested in exactly what this story is about, what we have is for those not familiar with the Lindbergh baby kidnapping, of course, Charles Lindbergh, um, first um, first man to solo fly across the Atlantic. Um, Not the first man to fly across the Atlantic, but solo fly. Important difference. Um, He, of course, then became one of the most famous men in the world, and his baby was kidnapped. And unfortunately, the baby ended up being killed, and it was basically the crime of the century at the time. And so Agatha Christie took that as a starting point, and she has a famous, in this case, British aviator whose baby is kidnapped and then murdered. And then she extends the story so that... The aviator feels so distraught that he and his wife both die in very short order um, during the kidnapping. A maid is killed. Um, Lindbergh, of course, did not die right after the Lindbergh baby was kidnapped. He lived actually almost to the start of this movie. Um, so she took that as a starting point. And then that's in the that's in the 20s. So this movie takes place in the 1930s. And you have. A bunch of people getting together on the Orient Express, which for some reason, even though it is supposed to be overstuffed so that Hercule Poirot has to fight for his seat, um, there's apparently nobody in coach, just everybody in the (laughs) expensive single passenger compartments. There are 12 of them. And so Poirot needs to get on the train. The director is a friend of his. So the director allows him onto the train. And there's an interesting scene at the beginning that really sets the stage for this just amazing piece of history, this wonderful train, which, of course, we also saw in From Russia with Love. 
And by the time this movie was made, the train did wasn't in service anymore. So this is made from reconstructions and museum pieces that they filmed this on. But just as they're getting on the train, you have the lavish meal being brought in. And at the same time, you have goats. No chickens, though. No chickens. Did you see any chickens? I did not see chickens. I didn't see any chickens. Which is too bad because we love chickens. We do. We love chickens. But there were goats. And just wonderful scene setting. What 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 did you think as they were presenting that? Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was one thing. On the one hand, I think it may have gone on just a little bit too long for my personal taste because I do recall thinking at some points like, okay, that's okay. I get it. It's a big train. It's very cool looking. We can move on with the story now. But I didn't. It didn't get to the extreme. I didn't think that for more than a few seconds before. They jumped into something, so it was. I think it was well done. It maybe could have been, you know, trimmed by ten, fifteen seconds, and I would have still been okay with it. But otherwise, I think it was a good job of setting up the uh, the majesty of what we're dealing with here in the in the Orient Express. And then once we're on the Orient Express, we get to meet all of our characters. We get to meet the very loudmouth socialite played by Lauren Bacall and find out that a man ended up breaking into her cabin and quipped to her, too bad, too bad this wasn't 15 years ago. And I'm thinking, I wouldn't care. <laughs> <laughs> Just me, maybe, but I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, kick myself out. <laughs> Just saying. Um, you're introduced to Anthony Perkins, who is, gosh, a nervous, socially awkward man with mommy issues. <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah. He has a and he's, slight sorry, stutter going on. Not, not like super severe, but just a little bit to make sure that you know that he's not uh, speech impaired, but just nervous around people. Like that's kind of his deal. And especially since I had just rewatched Psycho two weeks before I watched this, <laughs> and he plays the part I, almost identically. So you can see the character whom Alfred Hitchcock jokingly referred to on set as Master Bates um, <laughs> very clearly in his character in this film. <laughs> Hitchcock. Hey, uh, guys. Uh, class act all the way. <laughs> and of course... Um, Perkins is playing the secretary or Man Friday to uh, a character who is an obnoxious American played by Richard Widmark, whom you will recognize but not know from where. He's one of those actors. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, um, like that guy. And this, I know that guy. That happens to me all the time when I'm watching TV shows in particular. I'll be watching something and be like, I've seen them in something before. And I always end up on either IMDb or TVRage.com looking and finding out. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. They were in this and they were in this and this and this and the other thing. And um, yeah, there's a lot of people like that for me. And Widmark took his part, by the way, specifically just to meet all of the other actors. That's how cool the cast is. <laughs> and really, not making that up. But of course, Widmark's character is murdered most foully. And he has a dozen stab wounds and he's been poisoned. And so Hercule Poirot, being the great master detective, is asked to solve the murder while the Orient Express is conveniently stopped in a snowstorm. And so then the second act of the film is Poirot interrogating each member of the cast in turn one at a time and the director of the orient express saying he did it or she did it after every single interrogation <laughs> yes I, that part was uh, amusing to me every time first interrogation it was definitely him no 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 second interrogation okay it was definitely her no 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 third interrogation it was definitely this guy i know i was wrong the last two times this guy for sh no okay fourth guy maybe i'll hold back my nope it was that guy I think by the time they got to the end, he'd have been like, I'm just going to wait and see what he says. No. He's like, nope, for sure. It was the, these ones, they could have worked together. They did it. This is it. It, it, it it's, it's just fun. to. Did you have a favorite interrogation? Um, you know what? They, they were all pretty good, I thought. And I, I didn't... I don't know if any of them... I, I did like the, uh, the one with Lauren McCall, specifically. That was uh, fun. <laughs> Because he was just shutting her down right from the very beginning. Just <laughs> And shutting down Lauren Bacall, even in a script, is a feat. <laughs> and if you want to see Lauren Bacall in action in her best work, by the way, I strongly recommend The Big Sleep, which was one of her two breakthrough hits with Humphrey Bogart. It's also one of the dirtiest films you'll ever see that was made under the Hays Code. <laughs> 
it's just the it is the best dialogue in Hollywood history, and I am not make I'm not exaggerating. Her and Bogart just back and forth, just damn. But she's also very good in this one, and Albert Finney shuts her down. It's just I agree with you. That was also my favorite interrogation scene. I have to say I was kind of creeped out by the Academy Award winner though, just because Ingrid Bergman's speech gets into Ian Fleming racist territory. <laughs> Because she's trying to save little brown boys because they are more backward than her. Oh, Ingrid. yeah, I, I I lost count at some point when she started talking about the little brown babies and the little brown babies that she helped over here and the little brown babies that she helped over there. And I was like, wow, I'm going to. OK, how many times has she said little brown babies? And um, she kept saying it and I lost count. And then they came back to near the end of the film when they're talking about the little brown baby some more. And I was like, oh, maybe <laughs> I'll restart the count. And I realized very quickly that that was fruitless because I was going to lose count again. He said little brown babies a lot. Like, oh, my gosh. I, but it, it fits the character. It fits the story. It's just, you know, to, it's kind of like when we were reading Live and Let Die. It's just a little bit off-putting, but you, but it, it is easy to set it aside. Would Just take the story for what it is. Yeah. And Bergman's performance is, of course, great because she's Ingrid Bergman, and that's what she does. <laughs> yes. Um, no, yeah, that one was a little bit uh, uncomfortable because of that. Um it was also kind of, she was doing such a good job, actually, that it was kind of hard to put a beat on her character. Whereas the rest of them, I felt I kind of had an inkling. I mean, now, it's not really fair to say that I had an inkling of what was going on, because I did have, even though it was a long time ago, I did read the novel. Um, so it's not like it was fresh in my mind, like I read it just before watching the film. But with mystery novels, even if you think you've forgotten the whodunit part of the whodunit, as soon as the story starts to unfold, you start to remember. And so it was, it came back to me very quickly. Um, you know, oh, yeah, 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 okay, I remember. I know what's going on here. Um, but even, even. But so, it didn't matter, did it? I Because oh, no. I, I, I had the same thing. I, I'd seen the movie a long time ago. I, I barely remembered the movie, but I remember the book. But it didn't matter. It was it was just so well played. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. and we're good. even going to break tradition. I'm not going to tell you who done it. Yes, this one. If you haven't read the book or haven't read or seen the movie already, highly encourage you to do so. And in that spirit, we won't spoil it, even though it's been out since 1974 and the book has been around even longer than that. We're not going to. We're, we're going to let you have this one. Yeah, we'll spoil everything else because yeah. that's what we do. Just this once. <laughs> but for this one, we're going to let you enjoy the spirit of the mystery, the fun of the interrogations, and also probably one of the best long, drawn-out reveals since <laughs> another one of my favorite um, mystery films and actually the one that, that really pioneered what you see as far as Poirot's reveal at the end. Um, it's a movie from 1934 called The Thin Man. Um, that's where the dinner party reveal really hit its stride. Also one of the funniest movies you'll ever see. Um, basically, imagine film noir that has comedy in it. Yeah, I know that's not supposed to happen, but it's a film noir comedy. It was written by Dashiell Hammett, same guy who wrote The Maltese Falcon, so I highly recommend that as well. Um, but in terms of Murder on the Orient Express, it's after all, it's basically all of that good stuff put together. And then as far as Mr. Connery, he is the most, I think out of all the characters, he was the least over the top and most stalwart. I, I could agree with that, definitely. Like I said, he was a much smaller part than I originally envisioned uh, going into the film, but um, not, I don't believe he was minimalized at all. I, I believe he, he played the part and he was given enough time to play the part well. And I think he did a fantastic job of it as well, actually. Yeah, you know, while the character itself is not necessarily, you know, it's not a character that you're intended to like or dislike in any major way. You know, it's not a character that you're, you know, like they don't set it up as like, okay, we want you to hate this guy or, hey, you're supposed to love this guy. Just kind of in the middle there. And that can sometimes be harder to play, I think, than one extreme or the other. And you do get to have lots of fun with him because you have Poirot intentionally trying to piss him off and succeeding. <laughs> you do get that. That was a that was a fun part <laughs> when he gets a little agitated just a bit. Yeah, it, and Connery just plays it perfectly. He's basically he's this very staid British army officer who's got a few secrets of his own, traveling with a lady. Of course, you know Connery, Orient Express. You don't expect to sleep alone, do you? <laughs> so, but you no, know, he he's kind of an anchor part to this cast of characters who are all a little bit out there. 
he's one of the least out there. I think wow. really there's only maybe one or two characters who are more down to earth, and that's it. Yeah, I though definitely what's, yeah, I agree what, with that. Though what strikes me as odd is the character of the European Countess. Um, she was originally, um, the original idea was to have Marlena Dietrich play the part, and the studio balked at that because they thought that would be too over the top. Can you imagine anything being too over the top in this movie? Um. No, no, not really. But like I said, this is one of those ones where I didn't feel the overacting really got to me as much as in other films it has. So um, I appreciate that they that they did try to keep it somewhat, um, I, I guess, a little bit toned down in comparison. <laughs> in to, comparison, because yes. let's face it, nobody was going to act past Albert Finney's shellacked hair. Right. But overall, Murder on the Orient Express... If you love classic films already, then this is an absolute must-see, must-own. Or if, like Eric, you're the type who might normally pass one of these up, take it from him. Don't do it. Do watch it. Don't pass it up. Do watch it. (laughs) Definitely worth watching. Um, I I would say take the time. It's not too long. I mean, it's a full two-hour movie, but it doesn't feel overly long. Like Sometimes you can watch some of these older films and you expect them to be shorter. And when they do run a full two hours, you're like, oh, gosh, it's over yet. You don't get that in this one. It, it, it is a uh, quality film start to finish. Indeed. So Connery fans, film fans everywhere, Murder on the Orient Express, 1974. We give it two thumbs up. Dum, ba, da, dum. Imperial. No, just kidding. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> so any uh, any final thoughts on that, or shall we move on to our next film? I say we go ahead and move on. If you um, want to add any thoughts, if you've seen Murder on the Orient Express and want to add anything to our conversation on it, uh, feel free to hit us up on Facebook. We are at facebook.com slash hermajestiespod. We're also at hermajestiespod on Twitter. You can email me directly, eric at foureyedradio.com, or on Twitter at Eric J. Dewey. And you can email me directly at Ziggy at CinemaOnTheRocks.com. You can also find me on Twitter at CinemaOTR. And for reviews of many films, including some of the ones we're discussing, and I don't have Murder on the Orient Express up yet, but it should be up sometime in the next little while, um, you can visit my site, CinemaOnTheRocks.com, and check out lots and lots of reviews, including of all the Bond movies, of course, except for one. I'm getting there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, moving on to the same year. <laughs> very, very, very different movie. Is this um, the one that your wife walked in on? Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> I, and I was just sitting there like, seriously, I've been staring at the screen for an hour and a half. Just like, what is happening? <laughs> Like from the very beginning, I'm watching. I'm just wide-eyed, staring at this film, going, "I what? I just but I what?" <laughs> to be to be fair, ladies and gentlemen, when I first thought of doing this episode, this was the the next one we were talking about is the first one I wanted to talk <laughs> about, and I could not wait to spring this movie on Eric. <laughs> I took great joy, glee, and just awesome pleasure in knowing I would be introducing Eric to this wonderful film. (laughs) This absolute classic of complete and utter what the fuck was that? (laughs) Known as Zardoz. The only thing that I knew about this movie prior to watching it was Sean Connery in that ridiculous bikini outfit thing. Red diaper and pictures. bandolier. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. He also uh, wears a wedding dress. Oh uh, yes, the yes. Oh jeez. <laughs> Reminded me of that, did you? Um yes, oh my gosh, this movie is so weird. But uh, I'd seen stills from this movie because people talk about, oh, Sean Connery, check this out. And you're like, what? And so I knew that the movie existed and that Sean Connery was in it and that he wore this outfit. (laughs) I never had any desire to find out any more about the movie. Wow. I mean, wow. This was to go and like I would have if this had been before any of the Bond movies I'd have been like all right you know hey actors got to work right um you, you you can't you can't land a big role like James Bond without making a few weird movies on the side um but this was after he'd already been Bond twice oh my gosh what <laughs> I just 
like, did he just not invest well? Was was that the problem? I mean, why did he have to take this movie? Did he, he owe somebody a favor? He actually had a hard time getting work after turning down Bond a second time. And people are like, well, what, are you going to turn down our movie too? Um, wow. Just so weird. So, so weird. Um, <sighs> I, I don't even have the words. It's just... <laughs> I mean, it just goes back and forth between this weird, like, kind of Orwellian thing going on to, you know, going from that to almost softcore pornography at times. And then it's just like, what? Like, that was my, uh, you know, the the unifying theme throughout the entire film for me was, what? (laughs) (laughs) Every time I thought, like, okay, now I see where this is going. And then they take a sharp left and I go, what? (laughs) So... That was the unifying theme for me. Um, how, how about for you? What did you take away from this movie other than, oh, I'm going to make as many people watch this as I can? Well, there is that. And I'm glad I got you to watch it. And <laughs> I encourage everyone out there to watch this movie. I am spreading the gospel of Zardos. And even though it sounds like I am being facetious, perhaps even slightly evil when I suggest this, I tell you truthfully, I consider this an all-time classic of the the what-the-fuck-was-that genre, and I even consider it a good movie. I'm not kidding. I think this is a good movie. Yes, it is incredibly weird. It is bizarre as hell. But you could not tell this movie with a straight face. It's just not possible. And it's if you want to look into it, as something more than just what then it's got some very interesting existentialist discussion it is actually meant to be a thought-provoking existentialist film again the thing that's going to come out at you first is that it's just weird and we start off with a monologue from a dude wearing the kind of thing that you would see from the 50s and 60s on people who are supposed to be playing egyptians (laughs) yes and he's got Drawn on his face with a sharpie, as if he'd been drunk. Um, a mustache out of and a really crappy body. beard. <laughs> the actor, by the way, his name is Niall Buggy. <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> and this actor is giving you a monologue, telling you that right away, he's giving away secrets about the film, and you're just going to totally forget what he's saying if you hear it at all, because you're going to be looking, is that mustache made out of a sharpie? <laughs> Not just the mustache. He's got this weird drawn-on goatee, but it's not even like filled in. It's lines. So any illusion you might have had about it not being drawn on is immediately shattered because it's obviously pencil-thin lines of Sharpie on his face. And And when eventually you get to his dwelling, basically it's an 11-year-old's bedroom. It, would, would, would you say that's a fair description? I would say that the entire movie felt like it was an 11-year-old's bedroom. It had those... Maybe maybe I would go so far as to say a 13 or 14-year-old's because the uh, the inclusion of the practically softcore porn in there made me think of uh, you know what I would thought would have thought of as really, really hot when I was 13 or 14 years old. Um, that's really kind of the feel I got from it, that it, it was all kind of a weird... Uh, pubescent fantasy world thing and it was what now just to enlighten some folks about where this movie is coming from it is coming from the mind of john borman who wrote produced and directed and he had just come off the disappointment of finding out that he was not going to be able to make the lord of the rings which he which was the project he'd intended to make before this that didn't happen so he made this instead. Um, a couple years earlier, he'd made a movie called Deliverance, which is the subject of many jokes, especially in the American South. Um, however, in 1981, he would go on to make a movie called Excalibur, which was, of course, the Arthurian classic, which also was the film debut of Liam Neeson, featured Patrick Stewart and so on and so forth. So this guy's known for some weird Because let's face it, that was weird, too. 
That is true. It wasn't quite on the level of weird as this. And I think part of that would have to do with the fact that at least it was in an established universe, you know, being Arthurian times. You know, you know, okay, it's the Middle Ages in it's kind of fantasy, but it's at least set. There's there's some groundwork there been done already. Whereas with this, it's just all part and parcel, just envisioned straight from this guy's just wacky brain. I'm imagining either a lot of cocaine being involved <laughs> in the production of this film or a lot of cocaine being involved in the production of this film. Uh, it had to be one or the other. I'm, I'm guaranteeing it was one or the other because just, wow. I mean, I, I get the, the basic premise of the story and what it's supposed to be making you think of. It is one of these, um, you know, storylines that if you take away all of the weirdness and just look at the base plot, it does kind of make you, oh, okay, you know, what could we be headed towards? It's one of those, uh, you know, future imperfect type of, of storylines. But... There's just so much weird that, for me anyway, I couldn't really get to that without really, really thinking about it. And I think the casual observer wouldn't get past that in most cases. I think the casual observer is just going to be at the stage of, and they might get through half of the film before being like, okay, well, the novelty of this weirdness has worn off. I want to watch something else now. That's I can pretty much guarantee you if I were watching this on my own, if I were just flipping through channels or something like that, or found it on Netflix and like, oh, look at Sean Connery in a movie. I'm going to check this out. And I can guarantee I would have turned it off at least halfway through. Or no more than halfway through, I should say. See, this movie draws me in like a magnet. I love this movie. <laughs> I love movies like this movie. So I, I take it. I take the opposite tag from Eric. The, the, this is magnetically awful. <laughs> magnetically <laughs> awful. I will agree with half of your statement, sir. Um, but <laughs> it it is um it's definitely a, a well you know now, it, on the magnetic term it, it is definitely a polarizing film I think I think this is one of those movies that you're not going to find too many people who are down the middle and just like eh it's all right you're going to find people who are either like oh it's great you have to watch it or you're going to find people like what the heck was that never ever ever think about watching that if you see this movie in a store buy it to destroy it so there's one less copy available like that's the the complete polar opposites you're going to find from people because i think it's that type of movie i don't think you're going to get too many people who are just like yeah it was all right it's awesome <laughs> it's freaking awesome I, I i strongly encourage everyone to see this just maybe not necessarily with small children around or extremely prudish um relatives but um Anyway, it, to, if you want to get a little bit of a grounding in this, you can tell that a lot of John Borman's inspiration came from H.G. Wells' The Time Machine, specifically the 1960 film interpretation of it, because it takes some of those themes and turns them over on its head. Because, um, of course, in The Time Machine, you have the po- post-apocalyptic world, um, and what you have are the thuggish brutes, who in that film actually rule the world, and they have the, you know, extremely white, extremely affluent-looking people, whom they, in fact, are breeding as a food source. Whereas in this particular film, you have the extremely white, extremely affluent-looking, because there is not anyone who tans in this bunch, okay? (laughs) Sean Connery has the darkest skin there is. Um, and then you, and they're the ones who live in their protected little vortices and they are manipulating the brutish, thuggish society of all of the common folk who are left out in the wastelands of the post-apocalypse. This film takes place in the 23rd century. So instead of Captain Kirk in Star Trek, you get Zardoz. (laughs) I think I'll uh, take my Captain Kirk and, and leave. Thank you very much. Um, as you say, you believe it had some awe being awesome. I believe that it was full of awe. That's right. I believe this movie to be awful. Um, so there's definitely a difference of opinion on this one. <laughs> and now to, to, to take it even a little bit further, um, the way in which the affluent society controls the other society, which are, ba- which are called brutals, by the way, um, is they have con- they've left it up to this one guy, the guy who gave us the speech at the beginning of the film, and he decided to create a giant stone head and pose that to people as their god. So basically he wrote some science fiction and said, here, I have a religion for you. 
who does that sound like? I don't know. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Was there a so lot this, of, the, the, and it came to passes in there somewhere? Just curious. Anyways. And it came to pass that um, the giant stone head was called Zardoz. And we find out later that this is a clever melding of the title, The Wizard of Oz. Get it? Aha! Oh. Zardoz. Yeah, you have a little man hiding behind a gigantic mask and a loud voice. And this loud voice it is amazingly not done by Charlton Heston. <laughs> And the reason I say that it's amazing that it's not done sharp by Charlton Heston is because among the amazing speeches in this movie are the gun is good. And then the Stonehead vomits up guns to, so that all of the brutals, well, the, the specific <laughs> tribe of chosen brutals called the exterminators, because we can only have the chosen people. This gun just just guns just flowing out of it like. There had to have been ten guns for every exterminator that was there, and they were all running around. Like, oh yeah! Give me and they're some guns. giant shells, and it's it, so the gun is good. The penis is evil. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's a line of dialogue that is bellowed in about that in a louder voice than that. And the explanation of this is the gun shoots seeds of death. The penis shoots seeds of life. We must exterminate the blight of man. Yes, the chosen people, the exterminators, are meant to kill brutals whenever they see them because they're overpopulating the earth and the, you know, um, non-tanning white people don't like that. So not only do the non-tanning white people not like the fact that the brutals are overpopulated, but the non-tanning white people, they also happen to have some mentally ill non-tanning white people that they don't want to bother growing food for. So they'll let some of the brutals live if they'll grow wheat. So the exterminators are suddenly forced to enslave some of the brutals. And this doesn't sit well with some of the exterminators because this isn't the word of Zardoz that they know. And so begins the merry chase wherein Zed, our hero, played by Sean Connery in a red diaper, and climbs and into the head of Zardoz, which is collecting the wheat, and decides to see where Zardoz goes and visit the promised land of the non-tanning white people, who are also generally incredibly thin, and just like Hugo Drax's version of the future, the women are not allowed to have boobs. Well, at least not. You will see... Maybe two women who are not just tertiary characters, but like four or five down the line who may have a C cup. (laughs) But generally, it's A to B, and that's about it. So, and they generally don't approve. They generally don't approve of covering them. Yeah, exactly. Um, Yeah, they're pretty free flowing with the uh, with the with the frontal nudity in this film. Like I said, there are some points where it almost gets to the point of, um, you know, Skinamax type uh, 3 a.m. fair, but um, it's not too distracting in comparison to how distracting the rest of the movie is. So, <laughs> well, the other thing, too, is it's a sexless society. That's one of its problems is that they haven't been able to achieve male erection in about 200 years well because and at least <laughs> well the, the the idea is that the the non-tanning white people are immortal they don't age they don't die <clears throat> so there's no need to repopulate so because the need to repopulate went away the ability to repopulate went away as well um which okay i understand that theory um and then, of course, you have their, you know, the mentally ill people that you were talking about. They're not necessarily mentally ill. What's weird is they've they found a way to to age people, but they won't let them actually die. They'll age them to punish them for not conforming to society. So we're going to make but, you old. You're still going to live forever. You're just going to do it old. You're just going to basically be sentenced to a li- uh, an eternity of Alzheimer's disease, which is pretty terrible. Yeah, but it's, yeah. but that that. That's only one segment of their population they're growing the wheat for. There's also, and this is the segment I was really thinking of, the apathetics. The ones who just said, you know what, I'm going to live forever and I just don't give a shit about anything anymore. Yeah. So I'm just going to stand here and do nothing at all. Which did lead to one of the harder to watch scenes for me because, you know, Zed is supposed to be our hero. And anytime you throw the throw a character in there trying to uh, essentially rape somebody, it kind of takes you out of that. Oh, I want to root for this guy mode uh, for pretty much the rest of the film. And no, he doesn't go through with it. And I, you know, it's mostly because 
she's not fighting back. I think if she'd have fought back, eh, you know, maybe. Well, it you didn't have, but as she was, Mr. Fleming would say, <laughs> the sweet yeah. tang of rape. Yes. No, it was. Uh, disturbing. I mean, when he's first introduced to the apathetics and, you know, he's being shown that, look, you can put her arm over here, put her arm over here, do this, do that, doesn't matter, they don't care. And so he goes over to the first one and just, I'm going to grab some booby. And uh, she doesn't care. So it's like, well, I'm just going to pick her up, throw her on this pile of hay and do things to her. She doesn't care. Um, and that's the point where he's like, well, geez, she's not even going to fight back. What's the point? And that's, that's where I was just kind of like, oh, Zed, come on, man. So when you when you look back into his memories, he actually goes through with it because even though in in the past you see he did that, which is as you said not cool. Um, but of course, even though they have to kill all the brutals, the exterminators have to reproduce somehow. So they do that by rape. Evidently, yeah. It it makes it a very hard character to root for, and then you have the weirdness factor of the whole thing. And uh, you know, for me, uh, again, I just have to. You know, you're getting, you're getting the thumbs down on this side for me. This is one I don't feel it necessary to subject others to, but you do feel different. So, uh, you know, it's everybody good. needs to watch this movie. And <laughs> yes, the rape thing isn't cool, but at least it fits into the story. You understand why it's there. And in fact, the brutality of it is a specific point to philosophy that they're that they're railing against. Um, while at the same time, they're also deciding that the on- that one of the only ways they might be able to save future civilization is for Zed to impregnate everybody. Yes, give us your so, seed. We will give you our knowledge. That was yes, a weird we will, scene. We will to touch teach you. Touch teach. We, you will learn through osmosis while we hump. Um, yes, and you have to stay within Sean Connery's aura. Yeah. Oh, that that that, that is the scene. actual one point where I'm always drawn out of the film when Connery says, stay in my aura. Cause I'm like, where the hell did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> That's the one point, the one point, That's the That's... one and only point in the movie where I'm like, where the hell did that come from? For me, the one and only point in the movie that didn't take me away from any point of reality was the title sequence. Uh, you know, the, the distributorship telling me who they were. Uh, <laughs> after that, it was pretty much gone till the credits rolled. Um, no, I going to have to disagree with you on this one. Uh, it may be a classic, but it's a classic pile of dog do. Stay away from it. So now that we know your overall opinions of this classic film, <laughs> how do you feel about Connery in this classic film? Oh, well, okay. I'm going to say <laughs> that he did a good job of playing this particular part as it was written, as far as I know. I think it's a very hard question to answer because I have absolutely no clue what the person who wrote it was thinking. So it's hard for me to say, oh, yeah, yeah, he, he, he played it as it was written. So um, it doesn't seem to me that Connery added any weirdness to it. I think all the weirdness was already there, and he just did what he had to do. He was, you know, at the end of the day, he took off his red diaper and said, where's my check? And while he's in that red diaper, by the way, he jiggles more than many of the women. This is not toned buff no, Connery. This is not. No, the, it's very hairy. Very hairy. And that that's another thing where this kind of speaks to the standard of the time because at that point hairy men who weren't really toned and kind of unwashed with these ridiculous mustaches were okay. And so hey, 70s Connery, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, so uh, he's not well groomed. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. And just think, he was this. He was um, he was an he was depending on which story you hear about it. He was an alternate choice for casting. It could have been him. It could have been Burt Reynolds. <laughs> I actually prefer Porn Stash Connery in this movie than I would have Burt Reynolds. I think if well, Burt Reynolds, it would have actually been worse. Uh, Connery had the good sense to shave it off when it was no longer fashionable. Reynolds is like, nope, this is me. Deal with it. Um, but really, I, th- I think he's got a point there. It really is him. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think so Connery weird. actually gives the movie its gravitas. Yes, I think it has gravitas, okay? <laughs> and Charlotte Rampling is actually very good actress. And she plays in a lot of weird crap, just like this. Um, she was in Babylon AD for crying out loud. <laughs> But um, she plays Consuela, the one who keeps saying, let's kill him, let's kill him, let's kill him until she's about to do it. And then, no, instead, let's be lovers forever. 
And that end scene, which they had to film three times, which neither actor appreciated. <laughs> I actually like that end scene. I think it's a very poignant ending. <laughs> the time lapse I, I, of them growing old and, and dying. Yes. I, 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 th- I think it's... I think this is a philosophically interesting movie about, one, the nature of existence, um, the idea and the possible appeal of death um, as opposed to immortality. Like, can immortality be too much of a good thing? And also, of course, the very question that's brought up at the beginning is, you know, hey, I'm Arthur Frayn, also known as Zardoz. I'm a fake god, and I'm manipulating all these people. And I am perfectly aware that I am, in fact, being manipulated for your entertainment. So who's manipulating you? That is actually some pretty deep, interesting stuff. If you say so. (laughs) I don't know. I I mean, like I said, I, I understood basically what they were trying to say, I think. But it just, it was being said in such a weird just ridiculously weird way that i just couldn't I, I couldn't move past that for me it just never and never got past that for me uh, <laughs> this from eric who we learned in our last episode <laughs> will never see dracula in a ballet <laughs> the one good thing i didn't see any trampoline people in this movie, <laughs> so you know it did have that going for it <laughs> But no, um, yeah, I, I've i seen some weird stuff, and there's some weird stuff that I'd say, yes, go see. This isn't one of them. This definitely is not one of them. I'm not going to question Eric's judgment, but I'm going to disagree with it. And this is fair. a great movie. I think everybody <laughs> should see it as long as you have an open mind and are not watching it with prudish family members or just say really religious people probably wouldn't like this movie either. Um, but Hey, if you like the 70s Flash Gordon, (laughs) if you like 1984 with John Hurt, if you like the parody Casino Royale, (laughs) that's the weirdness we're looking at here. Go for it, man. Take a chance. Uh, I don't know. But, uh, all right. That's, again, why we have two hosts. We we agreed wholeheartedly on the last movie, but this one, going to have to give dissenting views on. But I got Eric to watch it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I did indeed watch it. That is that is undeniable, unfortunately. That's a memory I will take with me forever. He'll make someone else watch it. It's like the ring. <laughs> else watch it. Be like, you gotta watch this. It's so great. And then come back to me. What the heck was that? I was like, the curse is passed to you now. <laughs> I am free of the curse. <laughs> but since I know that this is giving Eric major pains, even though I love Zardoz, We'll move on to our next film. (laughs) And our next film is my... Again, I love the next film. I know there is a whole lot of bad about it. I don't care. (laughs) It is my second favorite disaster movie of all time. And my my favorite natural disaster movie. Because I'll tell you, my favorite disaster movie of all time is Life Force, which is also known as the Naked Space Vampire movie, where naked vampires from... Halley's Comet, basically zombify London. It's awesome. But anyway. (laughs) All right. This movie is, of course, Meteor from 1979. What did you think of Meteor, Eric? Um, Well, here's the thing. I (laughs) actually enjoyed it quite a bit. More than I I really thought I was going to, going into it. Because, you know, on the face of it, it's like, okay, so basically this is uh, Armageddon slash Deep Impact made several years, decades before those films. Um, But the same general, you know, theory is like, oh, crap, there's a giant rock headed towards Earth and it's going to kill us all unless we can find a way to stop it. Um, You know, it's not exactly a new uh, idea. It's something that's been around since you know people see rocks falling from the sky and hitting the earth, and they think, "What if that was bigger?" <laughs> so, um, the basic premise is is tried and true. Basically, it's obvious uh, a plot that they go back to again and again. Uh, most recently with the with the movies I mentioned, but um, for a movie made the same year I was born, or I released, I guess, the same year I was born. Um, oh, I, th- I thought you were saying, well, if we made the same year you were released. Oh, <laughs> really? Prison that early? <laughs> well, I was released from somewhere, but uh, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I actually really enjoyed this. Yes, it has its cheese factor. It's a 1979 
action slash drama disaster flick type thing going on. And yes, it's going to have some cheese factor, but it wasn't overpowering cheese. And I thought that the story was pretty well put together for what it was. You have not only the, the, the trial of the, you know, crap, there's a meteor headed towards Earth, which they actually built up, I felt, with eh, fairly solid science for the time. You know, it wasn't just a, a rogue meteor that uh, was always headed our way no matter what. It was actually knocked out of the asteroid belt by a comet. And I'm like, I thought that was kind of interesting. Although the fact that they just happened to have a space, they happened to have a, a shuttle in space, it's like, oh, hey, can you go check out the asteroid belt while you're out there? You know, that's... They were on their way to Mars in 1979. Yeah, Man. yeah. And they're like, hey, take a detour and go check out this comet going through the asteroid field. Nothing could go wrong here. Um, with the exception of that, I thought it had fairly decent science behind it. So I wasn't, it wasn't so bad that it took me out of it. Sometimes science fiction takes the fiction a little bit too far. And it's like, okay, dial it back a bit. Give me a good explanation as to why this would work. This doesn't do that. This, this, this doesn't take me out of it. The explanation of how the asteroid or the meteor in this case is coming towards Earth isn't too extreme and, uh, you can get into it. And then we find out that, oh, well, it just so happens that we happen to have this satellite full of nuclear missiles, which, of course, everybody assumed that both us and the Russians and probably China already have or had or maybe still do have, <laughs> depending on which conspiracy theory you're listening to lately. Um, they just happen to be pointed the wrong way. We've got to turn them around, right? But, oh, no, this one's just too big. We're not going to be able to do it by ourselves. So there is some political drama involved as well, because now we have to turn to, like, well, we know you guys have the same damn thing. Yes, they're both outlawed by treaties and blah, 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 but, yeah, we know you've got one, too. Come on, don't lie. And they have to work with the Soviet Union to, to, to make this happen, and that's a very interesting dynamic as well. And Quite frankly, I thought it was done fairly well. Like I said, 80s cheese factor aside, or 70s cheese factor in this case, but... I, I thoroughly enjoyed this movie. I, I would definitely recommend this to someone if they're willing to, to get past that late 70s, early 80s cheese. Wow. I am impressed. I am glad, Eric. I am very glad. Because, like I said, this is my second favorite disaster movie ever. <laughs> I, I love this flick. I Even though I knew the picture quality was not going to be enhanced in any way, I got it on Blu-ray because I love this flick so much. It's it's just fun. It's lots and lots of fun. And I can't believe that you still haven't figured out what I was sure your favorite line of dialogue would be. Give, give, give me a hint or something. Maybe uh, maybe it'll jump out at me. Was it Dr. Duboff line? would like to share with you now words he heard from a taxi driver on his last visit to America. <laughs> his toast, yes. Okay. Which is, of course, fuck the Dodgers. <laughs> yes. As a Diamondbacks fan myself and uh, you as a... San Francisco Giants fan. Giants fan, which I forgive. Uh, but, <clears throat> yes, the one thing we have in common when it comes to sports is that we both hate those damn Dodgers. So, yes, that was that was fantastic. I was looking for, I guess, you know, you told me, like, I know what your favorite line is going to be. And I was like, okay, I was expecting, you know, some, like, cheeky, like, Bond-esque type of line or something to that effect. And so that's what I was, I think that's what I was looking for. You know, no, I was going I think for he's attempting much more reentry, based, your personality. Sir. Yeah, I, I, I was looking for something like I think he's attempting reentry, sir, or something like that. That's what I was looking for, and so I think I skipped over that. Like I heard it, and I was like, all right, but it, it didn't jump out at me as the line that I was I was looking for. But you know what? I think you are right. That definitely uh, pretty much a favorite line of mine, no matter what context it might. Be. <laughs> and one of the things I appreciate about it is, of course, the character. What we have, um, as Eric was explaining, we have the meteor coming toward Earth, and Sean Connery is the guy who is the NASA part of this equation, and he left the organization when this satellite full of nuclear missiles went up in the first place, and found and he found out that they were pointed toward the Soviet Union and not toward outer space, because, of course, he designed it to actually blow up asteroids. And the Defense Department said, nah, we'd rather blow up Russians. So he left NASA. Now, Carl Malden who, you know, used to be in all the American Express ads and the Poseidon Adventure, and who can look past that gigantic nose? Um, he, can, he, of course, tells him what's going on, brings him back into NASA after lying to him twice and basically wasting two days of time. <laughs> and so Connery is the NASA end of the equation, and Brian Keith, playing Dr. Dubov, is the Soviet half of the equation. And what I really like about the casting of Brian Keith and of, as his interpreter, Natalie Wood, 
is they're normally in any movie where you have a Russian being played by someone who's English or American, the accents are the crappiest accents in the world. Because for some reason, the Russian accent seems to be the hardest one to fake. Whereas Natalie Wood and Brian Keith actually speak Russian normally. So their accents don't suck. They're, they're the only people I can think of outside of Helen Mirren where the accent doesn't suck. <laughs> so Brian Keith speaks Russian the entire movie. Basically, the only thing he says in English is fuck the Dodgers. <laughs> and he sounds great. You wouldn't you wouldn't suspect that this guy has a regular old American guy accent. If you just, if this is the only movie of his you've ever watched. And it's just it's great. And the same with Natalie Wood. She's just awesome. I I love the casting here. Yeah, they did a fantastic job. I I really did enjoy the the film and especially the, like you said, the Connery's part was even really good. I I thought he did a fantastic job of playing this scientist who was kind of basically outraged at what they'd done with his, essentially his creation. And when they bring him back in to be like, oh, by the way, you know how you said that we were going to need this for this? Well, okay, you were right. Our bad, our bad. But uh, we really need your help now. And he's like, well, geez, guys, you're jerks, by the way. But he comes back and he helps him out. And, uh, you know, there's some tense moments. There's some drama. I particularly like it when he t- when he tells Carl Mulder, why don't you just stick a broom on my ass so I can sweep the carpet on the way out? <laughs> That's just a perfect Connery as crotchety old Bond line, I thought. Yeah, definitely. Though, I did notice one continuity error after he blows up at the meeting of the politicians and says, Look, there's a 10-mile wide asteroid going to hit you. It's going to blow your blow your ass up. So you can either do things my way or you can discuss it until it's not anybody's problem anymore. I'm going to be in the bar across the street. So he goes to the bar across the street, starts drinking. He's watching a football game on television on a Tuesday, which is just about the only day of the week, even now when they don't play football on television. <laughs> Damn you. Maybe there could have been a replay. You don't know. Maybe it was sports center. They're replaying the highlights of the weekend. ESPN didn't even exist in 1979. <laughs> well, dang it. Um, well, there you go. So that, uh, that aside, any other major science errors that make you cringe when you watch this movie? Oh, you mean how the nuclear weapons would just have vaporized the meteor instead of blowing it into tiny little chunks so there'd be just a bunch of little meteors hitting everybody? Um, yeah, there's one. Um, I also noticed that the, uh, the these rockets, which were, <clears throat> I guess, they were essentially designed to... That's that's where you kind of get into question because technically they were the satellite was designed to point these rockets into the space to blow up asteroids, but when they actually loaded the thing up and shot it into space, they loaded it with missiles that were intended to land on the Earth. So the amount of fuel that would have been included would probably have been fairly minimal, just enough to point it in the right direction and then let gravity and everything else do its work. Now Whereas, they, there, I'm willing to I'm willing to be okay with it just because. I assume that these missiles were aimed by basically the, the kind of character played by Martin Landau in this movie, which is loud generals who basically use their missiles as penis substitutes. <laughs> and therefore, they would load it up with as much gas as possible just because they can. That, that, that's the mentality I'm looking at here. Okay. Now, the fact that these missiles are launching in the manner in which they're launching without messing up the orbit of their satellite was- or blowing each other up or crashing into each other, which they're visibly about to do in several of the same repeated p- pieces of footage. <laughs> that Yeah, that was the other thing I was going to bring up, the fact that somehow these satellites, which are orbiting, don't move at all when sudden amounts, huge amounts of thrust are being pushed away from them with these uh, <laughs> these rockets suddenly going off. It would have totally destroyed those uh, those orbits that would not have been possible without uh, retro rockets pointing the other direction and big sons of guns too. Um, so there was that, and that was really the only one that you know I watched that and I was like, oh come on now, this satellite wouldn't just not move. What the what's going on here? And then when the rockets just kept burning like they're still going they're still the engines are still firing all the way to the asteroid i was like they would have run out of fuel a long time ago and plus if you're in space you don't need to burn them the entire time you just point them in the right direction fire them off and then 
let momentum go because there's no air resistance to slow them down. And you notice that when they did stop firing, that meant there was a problem and suddenly they flicked off to the side instead of just going with forward momentum. Yeah. Oh, no, that one broke. <coughs> I'm like, why did that rocket suddenly take a hard left <laughs> for no reason? They would need to have been forced applied to it for that to have happened because it's not just going to veer off like a like a plane would or something like that there's no flaps to there's no air to for flaps to catch yes the uh, the rockets the actual missiles themselves a <clears throat> little bit hard to believe once you get to that point but by that point you're invested in the movie you don't really care that much it's just one of those little things you know those those nits we like to pick later on after the fact in the heat of the moment and for a movie made in 79 it's not going to be too bad and the tidal wave taking out Hong Kong, I thought that was really well done for the time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the graphics on that were uh, pretty amazing, actually, for the time. Like, obviously, now you'd look at it and be like, what? Come on. But for 1979, you know, yeah, I thought they did a very good job. And it, I also like that they didn't go for the cheesy ending it, with that particular segment because you have the, the dock worker who goes for the wife and the small child and even rescues the dog. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, so we're going to see them live. Uh, no. (laughs) Oh, dang it. And I I like that they actually had the, the guts to go for that because that's not something you would always see. And I don't think you'd see it now. I mean, because they always go for the fuzzy bunny moment. And they didn't do that there. They didn't do that in Siberia. I mean, any because before the big meteor is supposed to hit, you have the you have smaller chunks that are causing damage, right. and the damage is real in terms of they don't pull, they they show you these characters who are about to get inundated, and every you think that okay somebody's going to live through this. No, they all die. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's pretty dark in that respect, but at the same time, you get that realism that a lot of movies don't go for because they're like, oh no, we're not going to show any unnecessary deaths whatsoever, so everybody gets out okay, and you, it can take you out of the moment when you want when what they really want to do is make you appreciate how bad the situation is, and I think they do a much better job in this than if everybody did get out alive. And it's also interesting. Um, Going back to the Cold War bent, which I really appreciate because as fans of the show already know, I, I'm very interested in Cold War history and the dynamic of politics that occur- that was in the world at the time. I still maintain it was a safer world then than it is now. Um, but anyway, I, I like how they play the dynamic, not only from the aspect of just how we get the characters to relate, how we get the internal conflict of the plot, but also... If you tally things up at the end, the Soviets win. They totally win because what do you what do they lose? They lose a hunk of Siberia that they didn't really care about anyway. (laughs) Couple Inuit. And I'm not saying that there's anything that it's a good thing to lose Inuit. I'm just saying that 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 is their net tally. Now, what does the Western world lose? We lose a big hunk of Switzerland. Mm -hmm. We lose. uh, Oh, New York City. (laughs) We lose Hong Kong, British at the time, not Chinese. So, yeah, the West gets its ass kicked. The communist states come out okay. (laughs) They're like, ha-ha. So it's interesting that just because of the biases that you would think would be there, that actually the West comes out on the bottom. Now, of course, there's also the fact that despite the fact that Eric and I love this movie, it actually bombed and is considered one of the reasons that American International Pictures, AIP, finally folded. And that studio, by the way, is ma- is most famous for being the host for most of Roger Corman's films with Vincent Price. So the Edgar Allan Poe series, oh. just fantastic movies. If, if, if you love horror movies in the classic color era, I mean, it's really hard to go wrong with Vincent Price in a Poe flick. I mean, come on, Vincent Price, genius. Right. But this is basically considered one of the movies that murdered that studio because this didn't do so well, unfortunately. Because it, it's a fun movie. And again, it's Connery who brings the gravitas. And you can tell he's enjoying this a little bit more. He's not, he doesn't look uncomfortable like he did in the diaper. <laughs> anyone would be more comfortable in this role than in that diaper. I can't imagine anyone who is more than two years of age be, have being comfortable in his outfit in Zardoz. Well, there was that one astronaut, but never mind. Um, and, of course, Connery is also inundated with mud. There is the mud bath scene, 
um, in the Which subway. I understand uh, nearly killed most of the uh, cast. <laughs> it, it did not quite go as planned, and it took a week to film, but... For only basically five minutes of footage on the screen, it is actually, it's a powerful scene. It actually plays very well. And considering that you've already wiped out Hong Kong, so the Asian city's already been stomped. The Godzilla thing's already happened. You have to top it somehow. And so a New York mud bath is basically the only thing they got left. So I think that plays very well. And I think Connery does a great job in the movie. I had fun with it. Fuck the Dodgers. <laughs> Anything else you have to say about Meteor? Um, no, like I said, a definitely a good film. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, yes, there's going to be cheese. It's late 70s, early 80s. It's that type of movie where you're going to have some cheese. But, I mean, even looking back now at the more recent versions of this storyline, I go back and watch. In fact, I did this just a, a few months back. I rewatched Armageddon, which when it came I'm out, sorry. I thought was, I actually really enjoyed that movie when it came out. I was working at the movie theater when that movie came out. I got to see it the night before because I built the print and put it together. And I was like, all right. And I remember thinking, this is great. Went back and watched it recently. I was like, oh, man, this is cheesy. Like, yeah, the graphics are great, but it's cheesy. It really is. And Meteor is no less or more cheesy than that. Um, and I think maybe the storyline is a little bit better. It focuses more on the, the grand scheme of things, whereas with Armageddon, it really, you know, there was a lot of focus on the on the little things, uh, the relationships, as opposed to... I really didn't need to see Affleck and Willis have the peeing contest the whole movie, so I prefer <laughs> Meteor. Um, and then there's Deep Impact. We don't even talk about Deep Impact, because that was awful. But That did not have a Deep Impact at all. <laughs> yeah, it was... Uh, the best scenes in Deep Impact were the fact that they actually, you know, you know, the the destruction scenes of the the smaller again the smaller fragments preceding the big global killer that's coming. Those destruction scenes in Deep Impact were fantastic. But that was purely graphic, and you know, whoever was doing the model work or the CGI or whoever was in charge of that did a fantastic job. Whoever was in charge of the actual like you know script. Not so great, but um, so yeah, I would definitely rank Meteor if you're looking for a movie about an asteroid about to hit the Earth. Meteor can go to the top of the list. Absolutely, check it out. And for people looking for the Connery factor, good stuff. Yes, can't complain. The one thing and I will say is, is that this is one where he's got prominence as well. So it's not a supporting role. Oh, yes, absolutely. It's not a diaper role. <laughs> it's a prominent role. Yeah, and I will say the the one thing that um, you know I, I do like to nitpick at the science, and I will say the newer movies, obviously because they know more and they know more people pay attention to it, they do get the science a little bit better in, sometimes in the newer films. If as long as you're willing to accept that there are some things really really wrong with the science behind it, and just kind of okay, it's fiction, move on, you'll be okay because all science fiction does it. It's just the older you go, the older the older the movie. I think the more glaring the mistakes tend to be. Um, you know, like we said, the, the there was a mission to Mars in 1979, evidently, and they were perfectly okay going completely off course to the asteroid belt, which is not just next door. Okay, there's the <laughs> distances that are actually involved in are so much bigger than anybody really pays attention to. If you also uh, pay attention to the fact that. Yes, well, it's possible that a comet traveling through the asteroid belt might actually hit an asteroid. It's actually, when they depict the asteroid belt, in all movies that depict asteroid belts, they always depict these dense clusters of asteroids. Like, they're all over the place. If you want to get through, you got to duck and dodge. The fact of the matter is, it's a big, big space. And yes, there are a lot, a high number of asteroids, but the number compared to the volume is actually very low. It is actually possible to travel completely through the asteroid belt area without ever even seeing an asteroid. They are actually fairly far apart from each other. So that's And yet we still know that the odds of successfully navigating an asteroid field... <laughs> Never tell me the odds. Um, ...are approximately 3,720 to 1. <laughs> um that and uh, the one other thing, the big, big glaring one for me is that they knock it out of the asteroid belt. They point out that it's traveling at 35,000 miles an hour, which would take it approximately six months to reach Earth from the asteroid belt uh, at 35,000 miles an hour. But yet we've got less than five days to make this happen. Uh, and no, we got see, some time. We're, we're actually good, guys. Guys, we got some time. We could put up an entirely new satellite with more missiles by ourselves right now. See, the, the thing that actually hit me worse than that 
was that they chose to blow up the 10-mile-wide asteroid when it was just two hours from Earth. That just seems a little bit close. Yeah, I mean, just the the idea that, okay, and that now it it's coming. I mean, the only excuse for that is if they actually had played up the point that the missiles didn't have very much fuel. If they'd have actually pointed that out and said, okay, we only have enough fuel to effectively target them for this distance because they're not designed for space travel. So they're just going to go straight unless they're acted upon by something else. So we got to make sure that we get it as, let it get as close as possible. You know, maybe they could have twisted that. But the fact that they showed these things still had plenty of fuel <laughs> by the time they hit the asteroid. Yeah, they could have shot way earlier. But That's that what she said. <laughs> but that wouldn't have been as dramatic. So there you have it. But no. That's also what she said. Oh. Uh, but I'm sorry, folks. Science nitpicking aside. Eric handed me that one on a silver platter. It would have been wrong of me not to take advantage of that. <laughs> That's what she said. Um, so, any final thoughts on, on Meteor? I love it. See it any way you can. And if you're, a, if, you're a, if you're a big Connery fan or if you like disaster movies, it's worth owning. And realistically, you can own it for pretty cheap. Yeah, the Blu-ray is still set at full price because it's a recent release. Yay, Kino. But if you just want it on DVD, it's a cheap buy and it's totally worth it this is the kind of movie you can just kick back rainy day anytime you want yeah absolutely definitely uh highly encourage you to go seek out this film and watch it you should be able to find it uh cheap somewhere i think it might be on amazon prime or uh, i'm not sure if it's on netflix or not but there are ways to go see this without spending too much money go do so yes and that brings us to the last of the connery movies we're going to be discussing this evening and that is uh, the next science fiction movie that he did, and this was made, this was released in 1981, and this is a. Now I have no idea what Eric thinks of this movie because we haven't discussed it yet. But to me, in terms of overall craft, Sidney Lumet's work on Murder on the Orient Express aside, because we already discussed that's just Hollywood godhood all put together. But just in terms of the latter three, basically the sci-fi ones in this set. This is easily the most well crafted, just meticulously done of the movies that we've been that we've been discussing. And this is Outland from nineteen eighty one. Yes. Uh set on Io, one of Jupiter's moons. It's uh it's it's I okay. Here's the thing with this movie. I really enjoyed it. Bear in it. mind. I'm sorry, go on. <laughs> oh, I was gonna say, yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it much more than I thought I would going into it, especially reading just the little. Uh, I saw the poster, or I don't know if it was the poster or the box cover for the for the VHS, but it's got Connery standing in basically a sheriff's outfit with a shotgun, and it says, "On Jupiter's moon, he's the only law." And I was like, "Oh, that's so cheesy! Like that's not even good at all." The movie so much better than that tagline. Um, is it perfect? No. Is it cheesy? Oh yeah. <laughs> but it's good. It's got a really good story. It's it's not a complex story by any stretch of the imagination. It's your basic new cop shows up, finds out that there's been dirty dealings going on underneath all the other cops' nose for years, and he's going to be the one to stop it because he's the one clean cop who shows up where everybody else has been corrupt. It's, it's not a new story in that respect, but it's very well done. Like you said, it's really well put together. It's really well crafted, and um, it kind of it kind of plays out almost westernish in its style as opposed to strict sci-fi. I mean, obviously, there are sci-fi aspects. You're dealing with mining on the moon of Jupiter. But I, I felt it really had that kind of Western flair to it, and I like that. There's a good reason for that. Outland is a flat-out remake of High Noon. <laughs> Not kidding. It is a, that, That's exactly what it is. It is a basically the plot of High Noon was just rewritten as a sci-fi story, and this is what you get. You have Sean Connery playing the role of Gary Cooper. Um, you can substitute the word train for shuttle and mining town on Jupiter's moon for mining town in the Old West. And there you go. It is the exact same plot. Th th this is a flat out blatant, they don't even deny it remake of High Noon. However, saying that, I also understand that the majority of our audience has never seen High Noon and never will even though it's considered a classic of Western filmmaking. And you know what, folks? That's perfectly fine. 
I have seen High Noon. It is overrated. I think it kind of sucks. <laughs> I think I think Gary Cooper is actually a lousy actor. I will. Yes, I just said that. Oh snap! I, I I have not seen him in a single thing where he wasn't just awful. the The guy had the guy's a cigar store Indian pretending to act. He's just <laughs> he's not good. So if you have a choice between High Noon and Outland, see Outland. Way 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 better. And I've never actually seen High Noon myself, so um, I don't think I'll bother since I've already seen Outland. Actually, well, see, that's the thing about it is I'm not usually a big Western fan. I like the kind of comedic takes on Westerns. Loved Maverick. It's a fun movie. Um, Maverick was great. So what's the other one? Uh, Desperado. Fantastic film. Love that. Uh, true Western Westerns, not so much. Not not really a big fan. But I recognize the elements, and that's what this kind of put me in that field. But I've always been more of a sci-fi guy anyway, so it really spoke to me as being, hey, they're telling the story in a good way and still having it set in sci-fi land. So I dug it. I dug the heck out of it. And even though the science is a little off, because this is before they realized that Io is in fact the most volcanically active body in the solar system. <laughs> yes. So they didn't know that at the time. So there are no active volcanoes. They're just mining titanium. Oh, yeah. That's all they're doing. <laughs> and, of course, in order to make this kind of operation profitable, they would really like the miners to do a lot of work, a lot more than normal. How do you get miners to do a lot more work? Well, as the mine administrator played very well by Peter Boyle in just this amazing dwarf beard. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, one, make sure you don't water down the booze. Two, you have clean hookers, some of whom are even good looking. That's a direct quote from the movie. And you let them play hard. What he doesn't say, but what Sean Connery discovers, is you also feed them lots and lots of illegal drugs. And that's the conspiracy that he runs across. And, of course... The mine administrator knows it. He's got some accomplices working on who happen to be the only people on the station with criminal records. I'm sorry, I found that part hard to believe, but I don't yeah. care. Because like you said, <laughs> it's a movie. And there's also another Bond connection in this movie. Did you catch it? Ooh. Um, <clears throat> let me think. Do I? No. Okay. In the scene where you have the guy who goes crazy on drugs and is about to kill the hooker, in the um, basically love cubicle. Oh yeah, that's General Orloff from Octopussy. Oh snap! It is. Oh okay, all right. Surprise! And the guy who played Spoda, the first drug dealer, he, um, I believe, he had a bit part as a thug in the Living Daylights, if I remember correctly. Oh. Might be wrong. But so we have their basic. The co- the company administrator is dealing drugs. Everybody knows it, but we keep it on the QT. Um, the company high officials don't ask any questions because if they do know about it, then they have to stop it because they'll lose their franchise. Because the company is actually answerable to a government authority in this particular universe. So they got to be careful about this. And that's why Sean Connery can actually mess things up for them. Yeah. But what I like about it is he's not just, I'm a clean cop. I'm going to clean this play shop because I'm a clean cop. It's something more than that. And it's the speech that he gives in the handball court when Francis Sternhagen says, do you really know what the hell you're doing? Do you want to get drunk? And I love her character, by the way. Oh, yes. Dr. Lazarus is fantastic. Probably one of the best characters in the film. And I also like the fact that they never go for the romantic thing. They're just friends. I like that, too. But what is what I what you really for me is the crucial moment that establishes the character and also shows Sean Connery as an actor in a way you rarely see him. Because from James Bond on, almost every role he's played, he's been in control. Even when he's playing Zed in Zardoz, he's in control. But in this movie, he's vulnerable. And he gives his speech like, they put me here because they thought I deserved to be here. They think I'm a crappy little cop. And I'm just going to do what I'm told. And this is my part in the crappy little machine. And it's doing something I don't like. I want to see if they were right. And the only way to find out if they were right is to try and stop them, of course. So, But the speech that he gives and looking at Connery's expression as he's giving it, that is just a wonderful acting performance. And it's an aspect of Connery's ability to act that you don't often see. It's 
in a way, Connery's one of those actors like John Wayne. He al- he always plays someone very similar, but every so often you catch a glimpse of why he's such a good actor. And that scene in the handball court for me is one of those moments. Yeah, absolutely. It definitely very well done. And uh, again, the the cheese factor is not too extreme in comparison to to some other uh, films. <laughs> Zardos. Um, so you <laughs> can definitely uh, enjoy this film, even though it does have that. Uh, how do I want to put this a- antiqueness to it? Uh, it's got like a. Uh, it's very derivative um, in terms of its production design is based on the sci-fi industrial commercial greasy hell um, that was most notably shown in Alien. Um, it borrows very heavily from Ridley Scott's production designs. But also you have the bar that's obviously the Star Wars cantina without aliens, but instead <laughs> with human strippers. Of course, as one does. So I, it's derivative. But it's got that lived-in derivativeness, and it makes sense. The only part for me where it gets a little bit out of control is during the gun battle. You understand that the guy's an idiot for shooting a gun inside a compressed airspace. You know that. However, the film takes full advantage of that and knows that it's stupid. But when they blow out the greenhouse, didn't they just blow out all their food supply? Oops. Just a thought that might take a little bit for them to recover from. Just saying. Yeah, that was probably a bad choice. <clears throat> but uh, I don't think it mattered too much because I have a feeling that uh, they got shut down fairly soon after that. So. <laughs> yeah, and if you're a fan of explosive decompression, you have uh, decompression several times in the movie, so enjoy that. <laughs> You do, yeah. You do have that, which was uh, interesting <laughs> in the ways they did it. Um, kind of gross, but not to the point of, of gore. So it was all right. It wasn't gory, and it wasn't silly. We're not talking total recall Arnold's plastic eyes <laughs> bugging out. This, Even though the idea of explosive decompression as it is universally portrayed in sci-fi is actually not really correct, it's still, if you're going to see it, it, this plays out very well. And also... Uh, when you have the people going crazy on drugs, it doesn't seem over the top. It seems like, okay, yeah, a high person could do this, whether it's violent or whether it's just suddenly seeing things or whether it's the calm. I think I'm going to walk out in airlock now. <laughs> it, Hi guys. It, it never feels fake. In fact, that, that's something throughout the entire film, even when things intellectually might be a little overdone, the way it's presented, very expertly crafted by Peter Hyams, the guy who was behind 2010. Um, that's the work that most people will remember him for. He's the one who actually wrote and directed this, and he was also the uncredited cinematographer. The cinematographer who was credited didn't like that very much, but hey, they got paid. Yeah. Um, but he's made everything very real, and in the moment, everything just makes sense. And that really serves this movie well. It really does. It's like I said, I, I was not expecting <clears throat> to enjoy it. Um, in fact, I think I think I did it right by uh, watching Zardoz first of these films because <laughs> it left me with a low expectation for the rest. <laughs> Because I was like, oh no. Did you think I was going to send you Uh, nothing but crap? uh, Well, I was worried there for a minute. (laughs) Because I I started with Zardoz and I was like, what's happening to me? Um, But no, it it definitely got better from there. I actually watched them in the order of I watched Zardoz first, then I watched Outland, then Meteor, and then went back to Murder on the Orient Express is the order that I happened to watch them in for the purposes of this episode. But, um, yeah, no, I really enjoyed this one. This is definitely one that I would recommend if you're a sci-fi fan, if you're a Western fan, if you're especially a fan of the the type of mixing of the genres. Um, you know, people who are into, like, Firefly and that sort of thing would probably get a kick out of this. It's not going to be as, you know high-end, uh, you know, in the graphics department and things like that, because, again, this is from 1981. Yes, we're into the 80s, finally, but just barely. Um, so, you are going to have that that little bit of cheese factor. You know, you're wondering why they've got all this technology. They're able to m- mine uh, the moon. <laughs> They're able to actually mine this this moon, but still, every all of their communications are on monochrome CRTs. 
you know, I was like, um, really? They don't have some, some color monitors by now? Oh, but sometimes they do. When, they, when he's getting a voice message from his wife, oh, that's in color. But the mug shots, monochrome CRT. That's all you get. And dot matrix. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so there are, you know, there's some definite 80s-ness to it. But all in all, I say good flick. Go check it out. Yeah, again, this is much like a meteor. I'm sure it can be found very cheaply to watch in some form uh, or another, streaming or pick up a cheap copy on Amazon or something like that. The Blu-ray was actually released a year ago. It um, started out in the $15 range. You can now get it for cheaper. Um, totally worth picking up. If you're a Connery fan, sci-fi fan, Western fan, any of those things, it's worth owning because this is one of those that you're not going to mind coming back to again and again. Absolutely. Definitely highly recommend. I, I would say out of the four movies, um, three I would definitely recommend to others, and the fourth I would say no, unless I didn't like them. And then I'd be like, oh, check this movie out. Check out this movie Zardoz. It's awesome. Love it. Whereas I would recommend all four, and I love you all. <laughs> All right. Got any uh, final thoughts on Outland or any of the others before we uh, plug the contest again and uh, wrap up? Or <laughs> Don't be transparent or anything, Eric. <laughs> no. Um, each one of these is its own unique own unique animal. Um, you have Murder on the Orient Express, which is one of the last gasps of classic Hollywood and just done in very grand style. Um, lots of fun. Uh, that's the most purely entertaining of them, I would th- I, I would say. Um, next one, Zardoz. Eric is on the side of the fence where this is just effing weird and it sucks. Whereas I'm on the side of this is just effing weird and it is psycho and it is philosophically fascinating. And man, I'm just magnetically drawn to this weird crap. So I love it. Um, Meteor, my second favorite disaster movie of all time, and Outland just fantastically crafted movie just very good space suspense thriller gotta love it so i'm recommending all four all right fair enough and like i said i would recommend all but zardoz um if you're into weird stuff then by all means go check it out but uh for me it's just just too much too much in the weird factor not enough anything else to to keep it grounded for me but and yet that, next halloween eric is going to be wearing a red diaper and bandoliers yeah, I don't know. I can't. I don't know if I could pull off that look. I don't have nearly enough hair on my body, um, so <laughs> it might not work out so well. I'd just be the I'd just be the chubby, pale, white guy wearing a red diaper, and people would be like, "Who are you supposed to be?" <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like Zardoz. Actually, I'm dead. <laughs> not Zardoz. I'd have to be a giant stone head spitting out <laughs> guns to be Zardoz. But anyway, your beard would have to be drawn on with a sharpie. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> But I guess, uh, like I said, we do want to plug the contest one more time. If you've been listening, you know that you still have some time. You have up until midnight, your time, Thanksgiving Day. That's United States Thanksgiving, so November 26th, um, to get your entries in. Oh, that's right, 27th. My bad. I'm not good at calendars. I don't do calendars good. Um, So get those answers in. Just pick a Bond movie, any Bond movie. Think. Take one little thing from that movie that you would change if you had the power and tell us what that would be. Go over to uh, hermajestyspod.com slash contest, plug in those answers, click that send button, and you can be entered to win our fabulous prizes of the 50 Years of James Bond 2 CD, 2, 2 CD soundtrack collection, the James Bond 50th anniversary playing card deck, and the coolest one of them all, the Hot Wheels edition, Goldfinger, Aston Martin, DB5. So much fun. Um, go do it. Enter. Yeah, and there's probably going to be at least one or two more things thrown into that prize package when all is said and done. Um, from all of the qualifying entries, we will randomly draw a winner while we are recording our Holiday Returns episode. I can't imagine what that will be about. <laughs> But it will be the first episode that we air in 2015. It will be airing starting on January 5th. We will be recording the episode during December. So get those answers in. We want to hear from you. Um, even if we don't end up agreeing with you, even if you say something ridiculous like Fomka Jensen should have been recast in GoldenEye. I mean, I will hate you on a personal level, but your entry will be valid. <laughs> You could be playing with the car that Eric loves. 
<laughs> I would be so mad if it's something like that that wins. I'd be like, oh, son of a gun. There's actually some answers I was expecting that I have not seen yet. I'm not going to say any more, but let's just, I'm, sh- I'm shocked at at least one omission. And I think you are probably too, even yeah. though we haven't talked about this. Most likely. Yeah, I'm sure there's going to be. I mean, there's a ton of stuff that we would change if we could. So um, we're all we're asking for is one. Give me, give us one example of one thing you would change from one movie. It's not hard. Pick something. Could be a, a song you didn't like, a sound effect you didn't like, a actor you didn't like, a vehicle you didn't like, a weapon you didn't like, a gadget you didn't like. Anything that you would have changed in any of the Bond movies. It's real simple. Get those answers in. Get them in. Get them in. Her Majesty's Pod.com slash contest. But that's going to do it for this episode of Her Majesty's Secret Podcast, where we have been discussing some of the films of Sean Connery between his stints as 007 from when he left the New York Jets and joined the Minnesota Vikings. Oh, wait, that was Brett Favre. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Brett Favre. No. Rah, 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 rah. But so that was our connery between the bonds episode join us next time where we'll be going back to the world of ian fleming so be ready for that but in the meantime i'm ziggy berkeley and i'm eric dewey and you have been listening to her majesty's secret podcast only on the four-eyed radio network this has been another proud production of the four-eyed radio network you want to see more shows go check out www.fouriderradio.com you wankers